There's a saying among the Chinese immigrant community where I grew up. If you don't immigrate to America by the age of seven, then you're always going to have an accent speaking English. Now, there is no verified scientific evidence behind this saying, but you'd be surprised how accurate middle-aged Chinese women's intuitions can be. I saw the saying play out pretty accurately in my community. For example, I had a friend who immigrated to America after the age of seven, around fifth grade, and to me, she always had a little bit of a slight accent speaking English. And then I also had some friends who immigrated in preschool, and to me, they sounded exactly the same as children who were born and raised in America. It was later on that I learned that there is a specific name for this concept: the critical period hypothesis. Which suggests that there is a specific period in early life in which native-like acquisition of a language is possible. This later on was when I was doing my master's in Chinese linguistics, and time came for me to do my master's thesis project. I naturally picked a topic that I had been thinking about since childhood: the critical period for sounding native. To those of you who are new to the channel, hi, my name is Julesy, and I'm a linguist specializing in Chinese linguistics and language acquisition. If that sounds interesting to you, please hit the subscribe button, and I'll see you after the break. The critical period hypothesis, first introduced in 1959 by neurosurgeon Wilder Penfield and Lamar Roberts, postulates that children not exposed to languages during childhood will have a difficult time acquiring it later on. In 1967, Eric Ledenberg introduced the idea into the realm of linguistics, further positing that if language acquisition doesn't occur between the ages of two and puberty. Around ages 12 to 13, then the child would not achieve full command of any language. Ledenberg supports this theory with the fact that brain lateralization, or the specialization of cognitive functions to one side of the brain or another, ends at around puberty. As you may have learned in middle school biology class, language is lateralized to the left side of the brain, which just means, in simple terms, that when you do language-related things like listening to speech or formulating speech, the left side of your brain is primarily activated. Research has shown that children who lost their left hemisphere through surgery before puberty were able to develop language skills in the right hemisphere. However, adults who lost their left hemisphere after puberty became permanently aphasic. Additionally, his studies showed that people with Down syndrome were able to develop language skills up until the age of 13. After this age, language learning stopped altogether. His and his colleagues' research convinced Lenneberg that language development goes through a fundamental shift after puberty. However, not all linguists were quick to jump on board with Lenneberg's theories. Although some people rejected his ideas outright, others proposed more nuanced ways of looking at the critical period for language learning. According to Herbert Seliger, there are different critical periods for different types of language acquisition. For Seliger, pronunciation may be lateralized to one side of the brain by puberty, but grammar lateralization happens later, making the window for grammar acquisition much longer. Carl Diller and Terence Walsh also support this finding. Stating that basic speech analysis is a lower order process that is consolidated early in development, whereas semantic processing is a higher order function that has long range development that may last two to three decades. Both of these studies support the idea that acquisition time closes for pronunciation before it closes for grammar. This claim is further supported by the idea that speech function relies on neuromuscular function, which is primarily acquired in childhood. Thomas Scoville adds this idea by claiming that only phonological acquisition is subject to a critical period. According to Scoville, the critical period for accentless speech is around age 12. After that, learners will never be able to pass themselves off as native speakers phonologically. Such strong words, Doctor Scoville. Are you saying it's physically impossible for me to sound like a native Korean speaker just because I started learning Korean at the age of twenty? Well, I guess I'll show myself out the door then. Annyeong. <sighs> okay, I've calmed myself down, and now I feel like I can continue telling the story. Although there are many supporters of the critical period hypothesis, there are still many detractors. 
For example, McLaughlin states that the aging of the brain during childhood does not diminish the ability to learn language and that no period of the lifespan is critical to such acquisition. Others argue that Lennonberg's key argument for the critical period hypothesis, brain lateralization ending by puberty, is based on inaccurate science. They argue that brain lateralization happens as early as infancy, with many cognitive functions lateralizing much earlier than puberty. Additionally, puberty occurs in different ages for different people, ranging from ages 8 to 14, with females showing earlier stages of puberty compared to males. In some cases, females begin puberty as early as 6 years old. Others argue that late teens and adults demonstrate advantages over children in learning a second language. Snow and colleagues studied immigrants to Holland, now the Netherlands, ranging in ages 3 to 5, 8 to 10, and 12 to 15. At the end of their first year, it was shown that the age groups 8 to 10 and 12 to 15 achieved the best control of Dutch, and that the 3 to 5 year olds scored the lowest on all language tests. Now let's get into the main crux of today's video, what the science says about second language learning pronunciation, and what the age cutoff for sounding native in a second language is. For the sake of simplification, a speaker's first language will be described as L1 and their second language will be referred to as L2. Irene Thompson surveyed 36 native speakers of Russian who had immigrated to America between the ages of 4 and 42 to give three types of speech samples, constructed sentences, prose passages, and spontaneous speech. Her results found that those that had arrived in America between the ages of 4 to 10 were judged to have a slight foreign accent, meaning that none of her subjects were judged to speak without a foreign accent. Невероятно. James Flagey conducted many studies over the years in regards to second language accent. In 1988, he surveyed native Mandarin and Taiwanese speakers who had immigrated to the U.S. and separated them into two groups, early arrivals and late arrivals. The participants were asked to read three short English sentences. He also had native English speakers participate as the control group. He found that the early arrivals had much higher speech ratings than those of the late arrivals, but lower ratings than those of native speakers. Through his many studies, he concluded that a foreign accent first emerges at an age of L2 learning between the ages of five and seven. The studies covered here are by no means an exhaustive overview of all second language accent studies. However, the general consensus is that there is a perceivable gap between the accentedness of early age arrivals and late age arrivals. Now, I'm not sure you know, but I'm a bit of a perfectionist, and the studies done so far give us a good idea of when a second language accent occurs, but not the specific age at which it occurs. So instead of grouping participants into early arrivals and late arrivals, I decided to get a sizable group for each and every age of immigration from 1 to 18. My goal was to have five or more participants in each age group for a total of at least 90 participants. Now, since the original hypothesis was Chinese immigrants in America, that's exactly the group I decided to study. I asked literally every Chinese immigrant in America that I knew, I posted on every Asian American forum online that I could find, and I even did street canvassing in Chinatown for two whole days. I gave out free bubble tea to anyone who fit the requirements and were willing to participate. The participation was simple. They had to give me a 30 second speech sample of them talking about a recent vacation or just something random from their life. In the end, I was able to recruit 93 participants, all born in mainland China, Taiwan, or Hong Kong. They immigrated to America or Canada between the ages of 1 to 18 and immersed themselves in an English-speaking environment after immigration. The goal was to get five participants or more for each category, but for the ages of 2 and 10 to 14, I was only able to get three or four participants for each group. Then came time for accentedness judging. As perception of someone's accentedness may vary from person to person, I recruited a total of five native speakers of North American English as raters. The raters were asked to judge the speech samples based on the following rubric. Before the study started, they were given speech samples for six, four, and two to use as anchor points for grading. Six, 
perfect speech, no accent. She would get shot of tequila and a regular Coke, <laughs> which was I was like, I remember that. She'd get a, a Caesar salad light on the garlic. Five slight accent. Four noticeable accent. And I'm not that fan of the Mars because I think it's easy to go to the Mars when you go on the top of the hills or of the of the, of the building. Three understandable with slight effort. Two understandable with serious effort. You know we are a company that's uh, we have the spirit of you know uh, working hard, uh, dedicated on our employee, dedicated on our work. One unintelligible or nearly unintelligible. Each participant thus got five ratings, and both a mean score and a median score was calculated for each participant. From ages one to six, a rating of six, perfect speech, was the most frequent rating, which means that the majority of speakers in those age groups were judged to be native speakers of English with no accent. Starting from age seven, the majority of ratings was no longer a perfect six. At age seven, the most commonly seen rating was five, slight accent. From age eight to ten, there seems to be semi-even pepperings of fives and fours. Ages twelve, thirteen, fourteen, and fifteen show more fours and threes. Ages eleven, sixteen, and seventeen show an even peppering of twos, threes, and fours, and not a single rating of six was found among these ages. However, age eighteen showed an uptick in fives, and even a few sixes were found. The data shows a categorical shift between ages one to six of immigration and ages seven to eighteen of immigration. However, there does not seem to be a direct correlation between age of immigration and accentedness from 17 to 18. Instead, peaks and dips in different age groups between 7 and 18 show that although it may be more difficult, a near-native accent is possible within these ages of immigration. The limitations of the study have to be mentioned. It was difficult to control for the family and social environments of each participant, so we don't know the specific English to Chinese ratio used in their everyday life after immigration. A better controlled study would be something like collaborating with a boarding school, in which a immigrant would be immersed only in English after immigration. However, boarding school usually starts at around middle school, so we wouldn't be able to get any age groups before eleven or so. In the end, I was able to mostly get an answer to the question I'd set out to answer for almost two decades, and that was, what is the age at which an accent starts to appear in first-generation Chinese immigrants in America? Based on the results of my study, the answer seems to be seven. So instead of arriving by age seven to get accent-free speech in your second language, you should arrive by age six. Of course, the results of one study and the results of the previous studies before mine cannot be seen as the rule for all immigrants immigrating to another country. These are simply the results of a hundred or so Chinese immigrants to America that I studied. It is certainly possible to develop a native-like accent in a second language if you immigrate after the age of six. But there are many things at play here, such as motivation, learning and language environment, as well as individual differences. Of course, this video is not saying you should have a native-like accent in a second language, or that you should strive for it. As a linguist, this is simply a topic that has interested me for many years, and I was glad to get, you know, a pretty much decent answer for the question. In my opinion, I think as long as you can communicate accurately in a second or third language, the accent shouldn't matter. In fact, having an accent shows that you're fluent in not just one language but two or more. And I think it's way more impressive to be able to speak two or more languages than being able to speak just one language absolutely perfectly. Thank you again for watching, and I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you enjoyed it, please hit like, subscribe, and I'll see you next time.